Okay, just one second. So today is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Okay. So remember that the this season after Pentecost, we have 24 Sundays. From the first Sunday after Pentecost until the end of the world. The 24 Sundays mark the history of the world. And now we're on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. And the epistle for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians chapter 1. Further, I give thanks to my God always for you, for the grace of God that is given you in Jesus Christ. That in all things you are made rich in Him. In all utterance and in all knowledge, as the testimony of Christ has conf was confirmed in you, so that nothing is wanting to you in any grace, awaiting for the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also will confirm you unto the end without crime in the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can stand for the gospel. The gospel is taken that according to St. Matthew chapter 9. At that time, Jesus entering into a ship passed over the water and came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him one sick of the palsy, lying in a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the man sick of the palsy, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, He blasphemeth. And Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose and went into his house. And the multitude, seeing it, feared to glorify God, who had given such power to men. That's why the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. So today, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, a few considerations from St. Peter Chrysologus, and also from St. Augustine. On the mystery of what Jesus Christ sees, who does Jesus Christ listen to, and why does our Lord Jesus Christ act the way He does? When the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 9, we read about the man that was cured of the palsy, was paralyzed. But St. Mark tells us more about him. First of all, he was in his own city. St. Peter Chrysologus says, Why did he go to his own city in a boat? If you remember, our Lord Jesus Christ walked across the water. He walked from Capernaum, his own city, to the other side, the land of the Gerasenes. He walked on the water. And when the Jews crossed the Red Sea, he moved the ocean from one side to the other. And when Moses crossed that, the water of the Jordan, he moved the waters and they walked across on dry land. Jesus Christ walked to the land of the Gerasenes, but when he comes back, he gets into a boat. And why is this? He does this because he wants to limit himself to the weakness of man. And he does this to make it easier for us to cross over because we're afraid to walk on the water and we're afraid to walk between the waves of the sea and he limits himself to the weakness of man. So he comes back into his own city and here he goes into the house, of probably the house of Simon Peter where he used to stay when he was in the house of Capernaum. When he was there in Capernaum, he was preaching as he was customarily doing and this particular day, as he was preaching in this house, people gathered and they were all gathered inside the house. Then they gathered outside all the windows and the place was completely full and the house was completely surrounded by people listening to his teaching. And St. Mark tells us that four men came and they had their friend with them and the friend was paralyzed. And St. Mark tells us, and they, they couldn't get in, but they wanted this man to be cured of his palsy. And they couldn't get into the house. So they decided, let's go up on the roof. And they went up on the roof. They went to the tiles of the roof, and they removed the tiles of the roof. Which was a very incorrect thing to do. They then let down the man in a rope into the presence of Jesus Christ, who was teaching. We want to see here 
What was in the eyes and the heart of Jesus Christ? What was in the eyes and the heart of the crowd? What was in the eyes and the heart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the mysteries that we have about the Lord Jesus Christ is that He has a special love of children and particularly boys. The behavior of boys. We find the great men of the Old Testament, many of them began to be great prophets. They began to do great deeds when they were still small boys. Jeremiah began to be a prophet when he was a boy. Isaiah began to be a prophet when he was a boy. And the three young men in the fiery furnace, they began also to be prophets and they prophesied as little boys to the great king and were thrown in the fiery furnace. And Daniel did his first great act, saving Susanna when he was a boy. And our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, He began His great teaching as a boy. And we read also in the Old Testament, the prophecy of Isaiah, it says, When the Messiah comes, there will be a great king, and there will be a great nation, and behold, a child shall lead them. This child is a young boy. He is the most loved child of the Philippines, the Santa Nino. He is a boy. There's something about Jesus Christ that He has a special love of boyhood. And what is it that He sees in those four men? What happens? What do they act like? One thing we'll note about what they don't act like is they don't act like men. They don't act like responsible adults. Because a responsible adult would not go up on the roof of someone's house. He would not rip up the tiles of the house. He would not borrow someone's ropes nearby when a closed store. He would not let the, boy, let the young man down. But boys do that. How are we going to get in? We can't get in. Let's go on the roof. Let's tear up the tiles. Let's let the boy, let, let the man is paralyzed down in the middle of the room. And then maybe Jesus will cure him. In moral theology, when you damage someone's property, we call that unjust damnification. When you destroy someone's property by unjust damnification, you're obliged to fix, fix it. You're obliged to repair it. And so what should Jesus Christ have done? He was preaching. He was talking in the house of Simon Peter. And there's a roof ripped off. And he keeps preaching. And then a, a, a basket comes down with a young man is paralyzed in it. And what should he say? You're acting like boys. You're not acting like men. You're destroying someone else's property. Did you ask permission to rip the tiles off the roof? Now when it rains, it's going to leak. He should have been angry. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were scandalized. They were very scandalized. This man is preaching and they're ripping up the roof. These men let down the basket. Where did they get the ropes from? I saw the men outside. They didn't have ropes. Now they have ropes. Where did they get the ropes from? Who did they steal those ropes from? We have so many horrible things happening here. And then Jesus Christ looks at the man. And St. Augustine says, It is God who has His divine heart inside of that man that is Jesus Christ. And He always sees more than we see. And He always gives more than we want. These are men that have their friend, a young man who's paralyzed. They want him to get his strength back. Why do they want his strength back? So that he can play sports with them. So that he can work and support his family. But they do not see the soul of the man is dead. And the soul of the man is in need of divine life. He is in need of something permanent. When you get your health, you're going to lose it in a few years anyway. You have health today, you will certainly die tomorrow. What good is the giving of health? And our Lord Jesus Christ looks at the man and He has compassion on him. And what does He see? He sees a soul in sin. He sees a soul in need of the divine life, the divine truth and divine love. What do we see? A man who needs to learn how to walk. He looks up to the four young men on the top of the roof. And what does He see? Their faith. He does not see that they are destructive of other person's properties. He does not see their unusual behavior. He sees their faith. And if we are going to be imitators of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to change what we see. We have to change the way we think. 
And unless we change what we see and change the way we think, we are doomed to be destroyed. They were boys. Men acting like boys. There's something about the boyish spirit. Boys are a little bit crazy. Boys do dangerous things. Boys have great visions. They have great dreams. They believe in things that men don't believe in. Men want security. Boys want to conquer the world. Boys want to have a great vision. Boys believe in other things. Greater things. Men only want a paycheck, only want to fulfill their responsibilities, but they don't have anything deep inside of them. And our Lord Jesus Christ said in the Old Testament, My delight is to be with the sons of men. His delight is to be with the sons of men. Not grown men, but the sons of men. The mysterious something that is inside of humanity that makes us foolish the mysterious something inside of humanity that our Lord Jesus Christ loves. And He wants to see inside of the soul. He sees inside of our weaknesses. He sees through them. And He wants to convert us. And He wants to bring us to heaven. We are thinking about foolish things. But He will give more. And so, we must change our thinking in order to be faithful followers of Christ. Now what about this Jesus Christ? St. Peter Gazalagas tells us He is God. He is the creator of the universe. He is infinite power and infinite strength and infinite greatness. And we should be terrified to come into His presence like Queen Esther, who we read about in the breviary today. Like Queen Esther was terrified to stand in the presence of the king of Sirius. Why? Because Assyrius, the king of Persia, he was a king from India to Ethiopia. He was a king of 127 provinces. He was a king of half of the world. And he was such a great king that if anyone came into his presence without permission, they were put to death. He was a terrible king. Terrifying king. And if we compare this king to the king of the universe of St. Peter Chrysologus, the king of the universe is most petrifying. No one is worthy to come close to the presence of God. But yet when that God became man, he put a magnet inside of the sacred heart of Jesus Christ. It is a magnet that attracts all things to Him. Attracts all the weak and all the foolishnesses, all the weaknesses and foolishnesses of man. It attracts those that are weak. It attracts those that are simple. It attracts those that are foolish to His presence. But the proud are repelled by Jesus Christ. And our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 17, the night before He died, He said these words in His final prayer, His final priestly prayer. Lord, I thank Thee, speaking to His Father, Lord, I thank Thee that Thou hast not revealed Thyself to the proud. I thank Thee that Thou hast not revealed Thyself to the proud, but only to the humble. Our Lord Jesus Christ is repulsed by the proud, and He is repulsed by them. They repulse Him, and He repulses them. He cannot tolerate the proud, so that when He is one night before His death, He thanks God the Father that the proud do not believe in Him. He thanks God the Father that the proud are going to crucify Him. He thanks God the Father that the proud do not understand, and He does not want them to understand. But the weak and the foolish come to Him. And in our age of the church, in which the world is in a great crisis and the church is in a great crisis, millions of Catholics throughout the world are leaving the Catholic faith and going to false religions. Other Catholics who claim to be Catholic no longer believe in what the Catholic Church teaches. They no longer practice the Ten Commandments and the teaching of our Holy Church. There is a great crisis in our church throughout the world. And now we think modern men, we think we've evolved, we think we've come forward when evolution is foolishness, and we think we are grown up now. And the world of grown ups is not the world of Jesus Christ. And that is one reason why the world today, in which modern man is so proud because he has technology, and modern man is so proud because he has money, 
And modern man is so proud because he has a security in his bank accounts. He has security systems on his doors. He has security inside of his car. If he gets in a car accident, the airbag opens up. He's safe if he crashes. He's safe because he's got the best doctors. He's safe because he's got the biggest bank accounts. He doesn't need God. And remember 100 years ago, there was a warning to the 20th century that said it didn't need God. And that was in the greatest technological ship ever made called the Titanic. They said this ship is so advanced, it has all these watertight compartments. And they said of the Titanic in 1912, the 100th anniversary of its sinking is this year. They said of the Titanic, not even God can sink this ship. It lasted three days. It went out of the the, the, the port in England on the 12th of April, 1912. And on the 14th of April, 1912, it hit an iceberg. And it sank. And they died. And why did they die? Because of the technology. Because of the technology, when the ship was sinking, it didn't sink like a normal ship. A normal ship, when it sinks, it turns on its side. And you are scared because the ship is on its side and you want to get off. But when the Titanic sank, because of the watertight compartments, it did not list. It remained perfectly calm. And the water was filling and filling and filling. And the people said, the ship is fine. It's not tilting. The ship is fine. And they refused to get in the lifeboats because they believed in the ship. And because the ship did not list. And you know how long it took the Titanic to sink when the water went over the top? Four minutes and 30 seconds. It went in the air, it broke, and it sunk. And it pushed the lifeboats away from the ship. And the people died. And it was in the North Atlantic where the water is colder than freezing. And when you land in that water, you die from the cold water. 2,500 died when most of them could have easily lived because they refused to get into the boats And they believe in the technology because we are grown up now and man has made a ship that God cannot sink. Man has made a plane that God cannot shoot down. Man has made a car that no one can die in. Man has made a hospital with such beautiful pieces of equipment that nobody can die. And you have so much money in your doctors that you will live forever. You know Walt Disney who is now burning in hell? Most likely. Walt Disney believed that technology will one way raise him from the dead. You know what he did in Florida where he is buried? He's buried in the top of the Disney castle. He believed that one day technology will be able to raise him to life. So he had himself put in ice. He's now freezing in ice. And he's waiting for the day when the scientists will be able to raise him from the dead. One day the electricity will be cut off and the ice will melt. And we'll discover that Walt Disney is not doing so well after all. Walt Disney is dead and he will not rise from the dead until the last day when Jesus Christ calls him forth. But he didn't believe that. And many a modern man doesn't believe that because we are adults now. We have grown up. We no longer believe in God. We have grown up. We are no longer children. We are no longer like the children that were before us. And these modern adults will not go to heaven. Our religion is a religion of a man who ruled as a boy. If you see old statues of the Santonino, he always has a globe in his hands. And if you see a statue of Mary with a child Jesus, he always has a globe in his hands. And why is this? Because the ancients believed that Jesus Christ is so powerful, he doesn't need to be a man to rule this world. He rules only as a boy. And this world is his plaything. It's his toy. We are toys in the hands of our Creator. One thing about Jesus Christ, the boy king, He rules, but He rules a boy over children. Suffer the little children to come to me. And if we become too adult, we distance ourselves from Jesus Christ. We must remember, like boys, that God will always take care of us. You notice a boy, when I was a boy, we were very poor. But I didn't know that. All I knew was it was time for breakfast and I ate breakfast. 
It was time to play, and I played. And I was always happy. I did not know that we were poor. We played with our sticks. We played in the rocks. We went in the swimming in the pond. We didn't know. Children don't know about money. Children don't know about bank accounts. Children only live in the moment. And God wants us to live as children. When you worry about your bank accounts and you worry about your future, you are not living like the boy king wants you to live. He wants us to have confidence in Him. As we mentioned earlier today, when my little brother, there were six boys living in my family, my mother had 21 children, but only six lived. And with the second youngest, my, my dad once was on the second floor of our house, and he was, uh, there was a railing, and he was taking my little brother, Boo, and he was throwing him in the air and catching him. Throwing him in the air and catching him. Over the railing. And below was a concrete about five meters down below. And he was a baby, maybe less than six months old, or maybe one year old at the oldest. And he was throwing him in the air and catching him, throwing him in the air and catching him, and Book was very happy because Dad would catch him. But then Mom walked outside, and she saw the boy flying in the air, and she saw the concrete down below, and she saw the five meters, and she saw the vision of her little baby on the concrete. And she said, Yeah! What are you doing? You're going to kill him. And he goes, what? He turned around and he kept throwing the boy there. Now he was no longer looking at him. So what, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? What are you worried about? He goes, you're going to kill him. I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to catch him. And then finally, because she was screaming, he pulled him in. I don't know what you're worrying about. I wouldn't drop him. He didn't know that if my dad did not catch him, he would die. He was within seconds of death every time he went into the air. But the boy didn't know that. Because he thought differently. He knew his father would catch him. And his father did. When we think like boys, we have a different security. Our security is in our father. When you're 80 years old and they throw you in the air, you are worried. You're worried about staircases. You're worried about everything because you may fall and break your hip. But a little boy worries about nothing. And we are meant to be boys following Jesus Christ. We follow Him into battle. We follow Him through minefields. We follow Him wherever He goes. And we don't care. Because we have confidence in Him. We are attracted to Him. And we believe that He will be the one to take care of us in all circumstances. And read with Peter because I guess we won't do that. In any case, we'll close it at that. And God bless you all. And your Father, and Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.